All right, uh, Romans chapter 9 for everybody else, Romans chapter number 9. And uh, I don't know about you, but I am enjoying this study in the book of Romans, guys. There is so much, there's so much doctrine in here. Uh, and as, as Miss Lacey hands out the uh, handouts, uh, the newer handouts, you're going to need, if you were not here last week, you will need 20 through 28, and then we're going to get through 29 through 35 as well, hopefully uh, today. So as she hands those out, uh, if you were not here last week, you'll need two of them. If you were here last week, you'll just need the one. And uh, all right, so Romans. Now, let me just say this much about Romans, guys. Uh, we're going to pick it up here, uh, oh, down in verse number uh, 21. Romans chapter 9, verse number 21. As you turn there, let me say that I was just talking with Brother Naylor about some things before church, having a great conversation with him. Just about some real wacky things that people believe. And, and let, me, let me tell you this. Um, if you want to be a very confused individual, uh, just Google, you know, what is sound doctrine? Or, or just, you know, find your favorite YouTube preacher and hang out there for a while, then find another one, then find another one. Uh, guys, I'll, I'll tell you this. One of the greatest Bible principles of Bible study is you, you, you interpret the obscure things by the clear things. Amen. All right, so let me run by that uh, with you again. You, obs- you interpret the obscure by the things that are clear. You, you, don't, you don't interpret the things that are clear by the things that are obscure. In other words, if you find that thr- throughout, I don't know, like half your New Testament, that Paul's writings point to the idea that once you're saved, you're saved forever, and then you find something over in James or Hebrews, it doesn't come out and say you lose it, but it sort of sounds that way, maybe you should interpret that obscure thing by the clear. It doesn't make the thing in Hebrews or James less true. It doesn't make it less sound doctrine. It's just a matter of where it fits in your Bible. And let me just say this again as well. I said this a couple Wednesday nights ago. It bears repeating. All of the Bible is for you. All right? All the Bible is for you. I've had people say, well, you just think, you know, this part of the Bible is not, not, I shouldn't even read it. I've never said that. I'm a big believer in going Genesis to Revelation. And when you're done with that, what do I do now, preacher? Start over. I'm all for it, guys. But, but all the Bible is for you, but not all the Bible. I know this is hard for narcissistic, self-centered Americans, but all the Bible is about you or to you, right? So, so I cannot take a promise that was given to somebody else and go, that's mine. You don't even allow that to happen at your job. And you want to do that with the Bible, all right? So let, let, you know, let's make sure that as we go through this, we're interpreting the things that are obscure by the things that are clear, and of t- interpreting the things that are written to somebody else as those things written to them and not to us and vice versa, all right? Uh, Romans chapter 9. Now, listen, we got into some real deep stuff over the last couple of weeks here in Romans 9. Uh, we talked a lot about uh, God's choices versus your choices. And you cannot play chess with God and win. Uh, if you remember nothing else about chapter 9, remember that, all right? You say, well, that's not in there. I know it's not a verse in the Bible, but it's, it's a good Bible principle, the idea is you're never going to like outsmart God. God has the thing figured out. That said, God does not arbitrarily do things without considering the free will of man. God's, God does not override your will. And we actually saw that in chapter 9. We're going to see it again because some of these things that we're going to look at uh, from, from the surface. Let me ask you this. Have you ever looked at something and on the surface it looks to be a certain way? Uh, maybe there's a viral video on, online on YouTube and everyone goes, oh, look what happened. And they show you two seconds or five seconds of something that happened. They don't show you what happened before it and they don't show you what happened after it. And you're to draw a conclusion based on that five seconds. Anybody know what I'm talking about? All right. And people do that. They'll protest and they'll gather thousands of people behind a video that they saw for five seconds on YouTube without understanding the context. Right. So what people do with the Bible sometimes is exactly the same thing. They come to it with a preconceived idea of what something is. And then when they find it, they go, see, there it is. Let me say that's dangerous. That's dangerous to do with your marriage. It's dangerous to do with how you raise your kids. It's dangerous to do with the will of God for your life. The best thing to do is to come to the Bible with, you know what, God? I'm going to come with no preconceived ideas. Lord, I want you to show me what's right. I want you to show me what's true. And as you get into chapter 9, there are some things that, that on the surface, what it looks like is that God just arbitrarily chooses things. And we've been showing you systematically over the last couple weeks, that is not it. Last week, we talked about God's choices versus your choices, all right? And uh, we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about that, and then we'll also get into uh, uh, God's chosen people, the nation of Israel, and the choices that they made. 
All right, so uh, Romans 9, look if you would at verse number 21. Hath not the, po- the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory, even us, whom he hath called, not the Jews only, but also the Gentiles. We'll stop there and pick up in 25 here in a moment. So on the surface, what it may sound like is God goes, okay, uh, you, 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 uh, I, you guys are going to hell, and I'm going to choose you guys to go to heaven. Uh, like, basically, he made certain people to go to hell. That is the teaching that, anybody ever heard that before? That is a teaching that some people teach out of that passage. I want to show you, from the Old Testament, the example that he gives. Anybody know what I'm talking about? The potter's house. All right, it's not just the name of a church, it's in your Bible, right? And, and, and the, the potter's house, you go to the potter's house and you see a, 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 a work of pottery wrought on the wheel. So let's go there, let's go to Jeremiah, and we're going to look at some New Testament stuff as well, but go to Jeremiah, uh, let's see here, chapter number 18, I believe it is. Yep, Jeremiah chapter 18, and then Jeremiah chapter 19. Jeremiah chapter 18, so, so here's the idea, did God just make certain people so that they could be sent to hell? Was that their purpose in life? Uh, I'm going to answer that quickly for you right now, and then I'll explain it. The answer is no. Uh, The Lord is not willing that any should perish. I can't make that any more clear, all right? God does not make people to send them to hell. However, uh, based off of man's choices and based off of what someone does with what is presented to them with truth, if that is the route they take, and we looked at this with Pharaoh ad nauseum, we exhausted that last week, all right? Pharaoh had a chance to repent. You go, well, God hardened his heart. Hold on. Who hardened whose heart first? You remember he did. And by the way, from Exodus 3, God saw through foreknowledge. That's how election works, by the way, all right? Election, uh, according to foreknowledge, as it says in First Peter, through foreknowledge, God goes, surely he will not let the children of Israel go. He does not say, surely I will make him not let the children of Israel grow. You, you with me? He just looks at the guy and goes, this guy is so stinking full of himself that I know when you go to him and you say God, and it's not him, says to let my people go, he's not going to listen. And so in Exodus 3, God says that. And then over there in Exodus 5, you know what Moses does? He hardens his heart. And then God does it. And then later on in chapter number 8, it says after God does it, that Pharaoh does it again to himself. Those are man's choices with God's. Uh, Look at Jeremiah chapter 18, verse number 3. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again another vessel. Aren't you glad God can do that with your life? Man, that's good. As seemeth good to the potter to make it. Now, let me just say this. The way that uh, God makes this, the way God sets everything up is, uh, according to Romans 1, 2, and 3, everyone's going to have a chance. Everyone's going to have a chance. Romans 1, you can look at creation and know God made it. Romans 2, you have your conscience and God tells you, I'm here. Romans 3, if you, if you are fortunate enough to live in a place where the Bible is available like you are, then in Romans 3, you've got the law of God, which shows you your need for Jesus Christ. God makes it so that everyone has a chance. All that said, look at the chapter 19, chapter 19, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to probably uh, read quite a few verses here because I, wanna, I want you to understand that what this is talking about and, and some things that are going on here. Now, first off, let me just say, in Jeremiah chapter 18, the context, look, look back at, I'm sorry, look back at chapter 18, look at verse 9, and at what instant I shall speak concerning a, underline it, nation, you see that? A nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it. Now, let me just say, guys, this is why you got to be real careful when something is written about a nation and what God says about a nation. God deals with nations differently than he does individuals. God can condemn an entire nation for what the leadership of that nation does, and individuals can still be saved. How about this, guys? Blindness, in part, has happened to Israel. There's a veil, as Paul speaks of, there's a veil over the face spiritually over the nation of Israel. And yet, Jews can get saved today. Are you with me? All right, listen, most of the Gentile world, all right, mocks the the story of creation, mocks Jesus Christ, Western civilization does, and yet people can still get saved. You see how the individual versus the national or the societal can be different, all right? How about this? In the Old Testament, uh, Elijah says, God, I'm the only one. Remember that? 
Do you know why he felt that way? Because in his mind and in his sphere of influence, he was the only one. And, but the, at the nation as a whole had turned on God, but God was having mercy dealing with Elijah. Why? Because Elijah was willing to listen to God. All right? So, so this, this whole thing about the potter and, and, and all that stuff, you need to remember it has to do with the nation of Israel, what God is going to do with them as a nation. There's a connection to that in Romans 9 as we get to the end of the chapter. All right? But that said, look at uh, chapter 19 of Jeremiah. Chapter 19. Thus saith the Lord, verse 1, Go and get a potter's earthen bottle, and take of the ancients of the people, and of the ancients of the priests, and go forth unto the valley of the son of Hinnom, which is the, uh, by the entry of the east gate, and proclaim there the words that I shall tell thee. And say, Hear ye the word of the Lord, O kings of Judah, and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place, the which whosoever heareth his ears shall tingle, because they have forsaken me. Now, let me ask you a question. What is he describing here? He's describing their choices. Is that not right? They have forsaken me, right? Uh, and they've burnt incense under other gods, right? Verse number four. And, and they filled the place with the blood of innocence. Verse number four. They built also high places of Baal. Verse number five. Burnt offerings unto, ba- unto Baal. Verse number five. Uh, you know what they did in verse number six? Um, they offered their children to, the, to a false god, all right? They sacrificed their own children. So God is telling, look, I've got a problem with you. Now, now look at verse number, uh, verse number 10. Then shalt thou break the bottle in the sight of the men that go with thee, and shalt say to them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Even so will I break this people and this city, as one breaketh a what? Listen, he's telling you, based on your, your actions, I'm going to respond. It's not that I formed you to break you from the get-go. It's that, listen, some are going to be vessels unto honor. We're going to see this in the New Testament. And some are going to be vessels unto dishonor. Whether you're talking about this on a national level or you're talking this on an individual level. Hey, listen, the Bible says in a great house, we'll see this in Timothy, there are vessels unto honor and vessels unto dishonor. It is not that God's desire after you get saved is for you to be a vessel unto dishonor. That's never his desire. But in a great house, you're going to tell me, guys, we've been through this already. We've seen that a saved person can be uh, guilty of committing the works of the flesh in Galatians 5. Amen? And if that's true, you know what you could do? Uh, you could commit adultery and be saved. You go, oh, man, I don't believe that. Okay, give me, give me a verse of Scripture for it. I'll show you that a Christian can do anything lost. I'll show you in Acts chapter number 5. I'll show you in 1 Corinthians chapter number 5 what God does with a Christian that is committing fornication. They get kicked out of the fellowship, but they don't lose their salvation. All right? So, so what, I, what I'm getting at is this. There are in a great house, let's just say a local church, there are some vessels, there are some people, man, they start off right. Do you realize when you get saved, everyone starts the same way? You you got a new start, all your sins are washed away, you get a new start at this thing called the Christian life, and you are a new creature in, in Christ. However, the choices you make from the moment you get saved, how much of the Bible you allow in your life, how much of the, of, of the, of the local church you allow in your life, how involved you get, how disinvolved you are, um, how connected to God's people you are, how disconnected to God's people you are, the list goes on and on. How, how much you walk with Christ in your daily fellowship, how much you don't, how much you incorporate biblical principles uh, in your home and with your marriage and with your kids, how much you don't. All those things add up. And you can either be a vessel of honor or a vessel of dishonor. It's not that God goes, I'm going to make this one dishonor, make this one honor, or you've got no choice in it, and God's the one that's at fault. And that's not the case. All right? Uh, Look at uh, 2 Timothy. Let's go to the New Testament real quickly, 2 Timothy. But does that make sense? You're seeing that God is responding, even on a national level, all right, to the children of Israel. And uh, he says, look, based on your choices, I'm going to break you. And they don't get put back together for thousands of years, guys. And now listen, I don't know about you, I've been backslidden before. I sure am glad it didn't take that long to get things right. <laughs> uh, God deals differently, I'll say it again, with nations than he does individuals. Now, look if you would at Second Timothy chapter 2. And, uh, oh, go to verse number 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure... Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. Aren't you glad for that? And because you are his, let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Now, let me, let me just stop and ask you a question. If the interpretation of you being a vessel of honor means that God just sort of took care of all your choices for you up front, why would he tell you that? Here's one. Here, how about this one, guys? 
Husbands, lady, can you, can you ladies finish this for me? Husbands, even as Christ also loved the church. I got, I got a couple of ladies there. All the guys are like, mm-hmm, yeah. Uh, all right, so, so here's the deal, gentlemen. Why would God tell you to do that if you're already doing it, or you did it automatically, or God did it for you? Let, let me say it like this. God does salvation for you. You couldn't do that. But God is not going to make you love your wife, gentlemen. Amen. You go, well, I, you don't know what I'm dealing with. Well, that goes two ways, brother. <laughs> and that goes two ways. It goes for all of us, all right? I'm, I'm going to cover all the bases and offend everybody at one time, all right? Uh, but but you, you understand that these are things that God says because you still have a choice in it. And based on your reaction to that choice, you're either a vessel of honor or a vessel of dishonor. Let's keep reading and find out what I mean. Verse 20, but in a great house the household of God, that's the context, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, now that's interesting, anyone that has studied the idea of the judgment seat of Christ, where does that sound familiar from? Gold, silver, and precious stones, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, all right, uh, that's different than the great right, white throne judgment, the judgment seat of Christ is about what happens to you uh, and your works, I should say, at when you meet Jesus Christ in heaven, and he goes, okay, let's see, everything you had the chance to do for me from the time you were saved to the time you kicked the bucket, what'd you do with it? All right, gold and silver. Then he goes on to say this, same verse, but also of wood and earth. Remember, remember over there in 1 Corinthians 3, wood, hay, and stubble. Wood and earth. Now, if you have a chance to have gold and silver versus wood and earth, what do you choose? Yeah. Right? So, so here's the, the, the analogy, the distinction, or the contrast he's setting. Some to honor, there's gold and silver, and some to dishonor. Now, if, again, I'm going to say it one more time. If being a vessel of honor simply meant that God made one person to be damned, and God made one person to be saved, or God made one person to be holy, and God made one person to be a filthy, uh, uh, a wicked person, let me just say this again. That would put the blame for sin on God and not you. I cannot say, God, if you didn't make me this way, I'd love my wife more. Right? By the way, I've got proof. My wife took a picture of me and said, I'm the perfect man. I've got proof now that that's true. All right? So regardless of what she says later, I've got it in writing. All right? Uh, there, there is visible evidence, and it's written down. And by the way, if it's online, it has to be true, right? <laughs> I, obviously, obviously. So uh, look, look here at verse number 21. Look at verse 21. If a man, therefore, purge himself from these. Ooh. She tell me, I've got control of this absolutely yes it's not that god just made one person to be this way and god made one person to be th and they have no choice in the matter now let's be honest we all have proclivities we all have things that we lean towards uh, uh i've got three girls three kids and all their personalities are different that's not what i'm referring to but that's also not the context of jeremiah 19 or of romans chapter number nine it's about somebody being a vessel of wrath versus somebody being a vessel of mercy you choose which one you get to be. You know that? You choose whether you receive God's mercy. We saw this last week. Man cannot make God have mercy on him, but man can meet God's conditions, which he plainly declares for mercy, according to Exodus 20. If you do what God tells you to do, you know what he'll do? He'll have mercy on you. All right? If you reject that, then you know what you're saying? Basically, okay, God, I choose to be a vessel of wrath. I choose to be a vessel of dishonor. Look at... Uh, Again, verse number 21, if a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use. And look at this, prepared unto every good work. Then he goes on to say this, hey, flee also youthful lusts, follow righteousness, faith. You know what he's telling you? You want to be a vessel of honor? Here's how you do it. So again, it's not a matter of you are God arbitrarily making you away and you have no choice in the matter. It's a matter of God saying, look, if you choose this, then you're going to choose to be a vessel of wrath. And if you choose this, you'll be a vessel of mercy. But you ultimately choose. God sets it up this way. Someone is going to be a vessel of wrath, and someone's going to be a vessel of mercy, but I'm not going to make them. Uh, think about it this way, guys. Over in the Gospels, when Judas is going to betray Christ, he says this, uh, Offenses must come, but woe be to the man to whom they come. In other words, someone was going to betray him. Judas says, I'll do it. He chose that. He chose it. All right. So uh, again, understand uh, uh, that. Uh, uh, look at look at uh, in your outline. If you have your outline from last week, number twenty one, man's choices do not make God's choices unrighteous. 
Again, man's choices do not make God's choices unrighteous. And then number 22, we choose whether we are vessels of honor or dishonor according to obedience. Your obedience or disobedience is what allows you to be a vessel of honor or dishonor. All right? So we choose that individually. All right, number 23, from the book of Jeremiah, we learn that God can do different things with the clay, but his choices were a response to their obedience or lack thereof. I'll read that again. From the book of Jeremiah, we learn that God can do different things with the clay, but his choices, in other words, what God does with the clay is a response to their obedience or lack thereof, all right? Um, and then let me give you this, uh, uh, number 24 in your outline. We were just covering a lot of ground at one time. God makes, this is, this is very key for you to get a hold of. God makes the vessel with our participation. Nobody can question God or blame him for the outcome. All right? So if you want your life to be different as a believer, then do what God says to do. Do not complain about your lot in life, where you were born, who raised you, uh, the, the problems of the past. Let me say, those things do influence you. I'm not completely discounting them as being factors in your life. But I'll tell you this, with God, all things are possible. If you want to do right and you want your life to be different, you can choose differently. There, there is no, listen to me, there is no addiction that you can't break with God's help. All right, there's no error of the past that cannot be uh, gained victory over with God's help. All right, one of the greatest verses in the Bible, as far as I'm concerned, is a living dog is better than a dead lion. Now, let me ask you a question. If you had a, a chance to put a dog against a lion and they're both alive, who are you putting your money on? Let's put your money on the lion, right? But if I blow that lion up, and I, I shoot him, I shoot him, you know, I get him right in the heart, man, he's gone, he's a goner. And we put that line, that dead line in the ring and throw a dog in there, who, who, who's going to win that one? Do you see, the, the point that's made in Ecclesiastes about your life is that as long as there's breath in you, you can win with God's help, all right? So you cannot blame God for the choices, that the, the way things turn out. You can say, look, 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 there are some things, you can wake up tomorrow with cancer, that is not your choice. I understand that. I'm being very careful about drawing a line between the things that you choose and don't choose. But let's talk about like the other thousand things in your life that you did choose, right? All right, those things are not God's fault. You go, I didn't get saved until later in life. Okay, let's ask ourselves a question. I'm not using my wife as an illustration. I don't think she'll mind me saying this at all. She was a, a 12, I don't know, nine inch nails. About 12 years old. Rough crowd, going to a Nine Inch Nails concert at 12 years old with some friends, uh, you know, friends, right? And uh, you know what happened? There were some guys out there handing out gospel tracks. She took the track. All the friends were making fun of it. So you know what she did? She doesn't mind me saying this story. She would tell you this herself. She got saved eventually, thank God. I'm not, I'm not still praying for her salvation, all right? Um, <laughs> she, she might be worried about mine, but... Uh, but, but here's the point. You know what God could say? If she, were to, if she would have rejected Christ and gotten to the great white throne judgment, you know he would have said, I gave you a chance here, I gave you a chance here, I gave you a chance here. All right? Th there's that. But even, let's just discount that and put it aside. After you get saved, do you know what you have? You have the Holy Spirit of God. Lost person doesn't have that. You've got God's holy words. You've got God's manual. This is it right here. I think someone said once of the Bible, it's basic instructions before leaving earth. You ever heard that before? All right. Uh, so so here, here's the point. The point is this, guys. We cannot blame God. God makes the vessel with our participation. When you read, let's go back to Romans 9. When you read about these vessels of wrath versus vessels of mercy, uh, let me ask you a question. If there was an Israelite that chose not to go, all right, and said, you know what, I'm going to be with the Egyptians on all this stuff, and they go, I'm going to join the Egyptian army, and I'm going to chase my own people. Where do they go? They go down in the Red Sea. Why? Because of a choice that they made. Is this making any sense? So God goes, here's what I want for you, but you choose. We're going to talk about marriage this morning. Here's what he wants for you, but you choose how it goes. You go, what about my partner, my spouse? I mean, they've got, yeah, and yep, yep, absolutely. You go, well, they're making bad choices. Okay, well, let me ask you this. Who married them? Now, I'm not trying to be mean or nasty. I'm just saying, you got to be real careful about going, God, my husband, God, my wife. Okay, but there was, God didn't make you marry them. 
Boy, that's real quiet. Everyone's, mm, I'm, not, I'm not saying anything on that one. Uh, Romans, Romans chapter number 9. And I want you to look at something here because this is important. Look at verse 22. What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known? Now let's ask ourselves, is this a, a, an emphatic statement or is this a question? This is a question. And the question is connected to something that happens back in verse number 17. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for the same person a purpose, have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, all right, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. It's about God showing his power through Pharaoh. That could have been done one of two ways. Do you realize that? Do you realize if Pharaoh says, you know what, God is right, the God of Israel is right, I've been wrong, I'm going to let them go. You know what God could have done? God could have blessed Pharaoh, and God could have used him to show his power in another way. See, you're not going to overturn the thing either way. God's going to have his power shown, but you choose how it's done. God's going to have, uh, listen, in all of our lives, God will be proven right. All right? Now, you could, I said this last week, and I mean it. You can be a sermon illustration with your life in a good way or a bad way, right? Right? And, 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 so, and so here we, we're looking at how God's power is expressed, and he's given the illustration of Pharaoh. And because of Pharaoh's choices to harden his heart and refuse to listen to God and to have his magicians try to copycat what God's power was, and the list goes on and on, God goes, okay. Game on. And Pharaoh goes down for it. And that is how God shows his power through Pharaoh. So look at verse number, uh, again, in light of that, verse number 23, or verse 24, or 2. What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endure with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? Some people say, well, God made them, and he made them basically to be condemned. Uh, let, let me show you this, guys. Look at John chapter number 3. Go to John 3. Um. Can I say this? Before you're saved, you know what you are? Every one of you, and myself included, you know what we were before we got saved? We were all vessels of wrath. All right? It, it, it's not like there's this distinct class. You're like, here's the vessels of wrath, and then here's me. Listen, we were all vessels of wrath before salvation. Look at John chapter number 3. You know what the Bible calls you before you're saved? A child of disobedience. All right? Uh, look at John chapter 3, verse number, uh, let's see here, verse number 18. John chapter 3, verse number 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned. Are you glad for that? Yes. All right. That, you know what? That, that, that sounds like you're choosing to believe on him, though. That is an act of your will. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not, let's keep reading, is what? Condemned, condemned already. Because he had not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Look at verse number, same chapter, uh, verse number 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. God goes, okay, if you choose me, I'll choose you. All right? And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. You are literally what Paul is talking about in Romans 9 before you get saved. And it was because of God's long sufferingness that you had a chance to get saved. Can I get an amen? I mean, listen, if we all got what we deserved, I want my rights. I want what I deserve. If we got that, guys, we'd be in hell. We'd be in hell. And what God does, he gave us, he gave us mercy. He was long-suffering. He goes, you know what? I'm going to give you space to get this right with me and to repent. Do you know he even gives, in the, in the book of Revelation, he even gives spiritual Jezebel over there in Revelation 17 and 18, he gives her space to repent and she doesn't take it. Uh, listen, God gives people space to repent. And, and during that time, you know what you are? If you don't repent, you're a vessel of wrath because the wrath of God abides on you. But once you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, God removes his wrath. And because you are bone of his bone, and I was talking about John about this before church, it's not just that God has you in his hand. You are members of his body. You may just be the finger, amen, but you are bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. It's not just that you're in his hand. You're part of the hand now. And so for God to say you could lose your salvation would be like him cutting off part of his body and part of him going to hell. And he ain't going. All right? So, so understand that before salvation, you know what we all are? We're all vessels of wrath. It's, the, it, it's accepting God's condition, listen to me, for mercy that gets you saved. God's condition for mercy for a lost person is receive my son, Jesus Christ. And when you receive him, you, know, you, become, you become a vessel of mercy. All right, so look at your outline, number 25. Everybody is born a vessel of wrath, according to John 3.18 and 36. 
all right? Uh, number 26 in your outline, to make his power known in verse 22 is connected to the person of Pharaoh in verse 17. And this is really important. I'm going to keep reemphasizing this because that's how it works in the Bible. God, through foreknowledge, number 26, saw Pharaoh would not let the people of Israel go. And after giving him a chance to repent, Pharaoh himself hardens his heart, and then God does so. So God goes, you got the first move. I'll give you the first move. You see that? God goes, okay, let's play. All right, I'll let you go first. All right, my turn. Checkmate. <laughs> right? I mean, that's pretty much how it works, is I'm going to give you the first move, and, and, and listen, you can choose which way you go with it. Either way, I, I will win, and either way, my power and my glory will be shown through your life, either because you do what I say to do, and it proves that when you do what I say to do, this is how it turns out, or because you don't do what I say to do, and it proves that when I say something that you're supposed to do and you don't do it, here's how it turns out. You're not going to win. Right? God always wins in the end is what I'm getting at. Now, you know the greatest thing in the world is get on the winning side. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I do this stuff with the kids, and we get down and watch a game, and we'll say, who are you rooting for? We did that with the Super Bowl, and they go, um, uh, Emma's, I want this one. Then when the other one starts winning, I want that one. <laughs> hey, hey, listen, if you're smart, when you're, when you're lost, you know what you'll do? You'll go, you know, this whole way the world's presented life to me, it ain't working. I think I'll go with that, that crowd over there. I think I'll choose Jesus Christ. I think I'll choose God's people, all right, and get on the winning side. All right, number 27 in your outline, God did not make people to send them to hell or else they would have reason to blame God for how they were made. The making, the making of the vessel has to do with things the person does in time, in time. And God commands all men to repent, all right? So the words in, in number 27 are making and then time, and then repent. Now, why do I mention the time thing? Because some people will take elect, you know, according to the foreknowledge of God from the foundation of the world. Talk about you were predestined, right? Well, listen, we went through this before. Predestination in uh, Romans 8 has to do with how you're going to end up in eternity, and that condition for being part of that predestined group is you accepting Christ, all right? And you are elect by foreknowledge. God knows who's going to get saved and who's not. God's not going to... I wonder how this is going to turn out, all right? But he's not the one up there going, okay, I'm going to make you make this move, all right? Um, so look at Acts chapter number 17. Go to Acts 17. Now, you know how unfair and how unrighteous it would be for, for God to say, I want you to repent, but I'm still going to throw you to hell? <laughs> now, I, I'm going to get on this in, in the morning service, and some of you probably won't like it too much, but we're going to talk about some, some rules for marriage and one of them has to do with forgiving. And uh, I'll tell you, we're, we, we, we almost, if we're not careful, can demand mercy from God. Like, God, I, I said I was sorry. How come 40 years of my life isn't fixed now? Right. right. Um, and then when someone comes to you and says, hey, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that pruny constipation face. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, I, I'm glad that God's not that way. Amen. I'm glad to come to him and he goes, well, you know, I know I'm, I'm commanding you to repent, but here's the thing, you're a vessel of wrath. Sorry. I'm glad God doesn't do that. Amen. All right, look, look at Acts 17, and look if you would, and this is Paul at Mars Hill speaking to the Athenians, who all they want to do is learn some new thing. All right, Acts chapter 17, look at verse number uh, let's see here, verse number 23. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. That's our job, by the way, guys, to go out in the world and find people who really don't know who God is and tell them who he is. Amen. And so Paul preaches that message all the way down. Look at verse 30, though. And the times of this ignorance God winked at. You know, there's some stuff that God sort of lets slide in the Old Testament. I'll give you one example. It's very stark contrast from Old to New Testament. Um, nowhere in the New Testament do you see God really condoning men having multiple wives. Oh God, come on, guys. Give me a little bit of an amen there. La I, I was expecting the ladies to help me out a little bit or something there. Um, but in the Old Testament, it happens with some great men of God. Am I right about that? And God doesn't ever say, stop that. You know what he does? He's like this. God winked at. Uh, 
not in favor of that, but uh, we'll address that when my son dies and wins a bride and she's one and he's one with her. We'll, we'll fix that just right. All right. So, so look what it says here. At the times of his ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth the elect to repent. Is that what it says? <laughs> uh, well, the all men obviously means the elect. You're, you're interpreting that by some obscure thing that's not there. He commanded all men everywhere. It's pretty, I mean, it's pretty conclusive, wouldn't you say? I mean, it's like, it's, it's there. All men everywhere to repent. You know what that means? You choose whether you're a vessel of wrath or a vessel of mercy based on your choice to repent or not to repent, all right? Um, go, let's go back to Romans. Is that making sense, guys? Uh, look at Romans chapter 9 and verse 24, and we're going to move on here in just a, a minute to something else. Uh, Romans 9 verse 24 even us, now let, let's go back to, to verse 24, that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory, even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Now it mentions that preparing unto glory. Uh, and again, that's where someone can say, see that? God prepared certain people. That's not what he's saying. All right, that's an interpretation that's not in the passage. Here's what is in the passage, because it's consistent. Now listen, guys, I'm thankful for chapter and verse markings. Aren't you glad when someone says, go to John chapter 3, verse number uh, 36, and go, okay, here it is. It, it, just so you know, the way the New Testament was given, as far as the originals in the Greek, everybody always talks about the originals, the originals, the originals. They didn't, even, they didn't have chapter and verse markings. It would have been like, uh, somewhere in the Gospel of John, a couple pages into it, something about God's love. I mean, can you imagine that? I, I'm thankful it's not that way. All right, but, but I want you to understand on the flip side, because we have chapter and verse markings today, sometimes we forget there's a thought that starts in chapter 8, and it's continued in chapter 9. So what you have to understand is, go back to chapter number 8 real quickly, and we talk about us being prepared unto glory. Chapter number 8, look at verse number 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. You see, what is that? That is preparation to be conformed to the image of his son. You say, what is he talking about? Look at verse 30, at the end of it, whom he justified, them he also, underlined it, glorified. So in chapter 9, when he says he prepared it unto glory, it's a reference to the fact that, look, listen, God knew you would accept him, and the moment you do accept him, it is predestinated, you, you are, it is, you're not going to choose how you look in eternity. God, can you make me look like my 17-year-old self? That's not how it's going to work. God, God's going to fix it, and he's, gonna, he's got it set. You're going to be conformed to the image of his son. And you can go real deep into that thought. I'm not sure that I can go into all that right now, but I'll just say this much. You're going to have a mind like his. You're never going to say the wrong thing. You're never going to do the wrong thing. You won't go. I mean, man, that's going to be great. He set that, though. He prepared that when you said, I will choose you. And by choosing you, I become a vessel of mercy. By becoming a vessel of mercy, God goes, okay, I am preparing what's going to happen. Listen, I go to prepare a place for you, Right? There are some things that God has prepared us unto glory. So in number, uh, let's see, number uh, 28 in your outline, the prepared of verse number 23 is connected with Romans 8, 29. The prepared of verse 23 is connected with Romans 8, verse number 29. Let's move on, though. Look at verse 25 of Romans 9. As he saith also in Oz, that's uh, Hosea, I will call them my people which were not my people. And her beloved, which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Isaiah also cried concerning Israel. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabaoth, had left us a seed, we had been a Sodoma and, uh, and been made like unto Gomorrah. All right, that's obviously Sodom and Gomorrah uh, there at the end of verse number uh, 29. All right, let me just remind you, Sodom and Gomorrah had a choice too. Let me remind you that God had a remnant in Sodom and Gomorrah and God told them what to do to get out of there. And uh, out of the entire family, only a few make it out of the city. And out of the few that make it out of the city, one turns back after God tells him not to and she becomes a pillar of salt. Do you see how it's still all choices that man makes? All right? And so God is going to get into this thing. Uh, this is going to get a little interesting, all right? Because in verse number 24, he's talking about not just the Jews only, but also the Gentiles. And then in verse 25, he talks about the prophecy in Hosea. Let's go back there. 
Look at Hosea chapter number 2, all right? And Hosea chapter number, if it's not up here, let's skip over the next one, all right? Uh, where are you at? If you're not there, we'll find you eventually. Can any, ah, there it is, right at the bottom, all right? Uh, Hosea chapter number 1 and Hosea chapter number 2. Now, let me give you this, and we'll go back and fill in some of these things, but let me just say this and get it out of the way, all right? You've got two different things going on here at the end of chapter 9. One, what Paul does, and he does it all the time, is he'll take something that's written to Israel that has to do with maybe, I don't know, the Great Tribulation. And I'll give another example of that here in just a moment. One of the greatest promises in the New Testament about how you get saved. You guys know what it is. Romans 10, 13. Who can quote it? If you can quote it, go ahead. Romans 10, 13. That's Romans 6. That's good. I'll take it, though. Romans 10, 13. Anybody? Yeah, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Anybody remember that verse? All right, how many of you guys read that verse before you got saved and go, I want to get saved? Anybody here like that? All right, whether you're a little kid or an adult. All right, can I, can I say this? That is a quote from Joel chapter 2. And in Joel chapter 2, it reads a little bit differently. It says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. The implication there is a physical salvation. And it has to do with the remnant of Israel. That's Joel chapter 2. You can read this for yourself later when you have time. It's the remnant of Israel. They're running for their lives. They are surrounded at the battle of Armageddon. And they cry out to God. And that's when, uh, and off in the distant eastern sky, a blaze of glory opens up the heavens. And a man on a white horse shows up. And he comes down. And there's an army from heaven that follows him, Revelation 19. And he comes down and wipes out the enemies of Israel and the Antichrist at the battle of Armageddon. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Because I could sound crazy right now if you have now if you never read this before, you're like, what is he talking about? It's in your Bible, Revelation 19:20. All right. The idea is this: Paul takes stuff that sometimes applies to Israel doctrinally. And he goes, okay, I'm going to apply this to the church spiritually. Does that make sense? And even with some of the words that are changed, whosoever shall call upon the Lord shall be delivered, Joel 2. Whosoever shall call upon the Lord shall be saved, Romans 10. Sometimes the word "saved" in your Bible is physical in nature. Sometimes it's spiritual. And so what Paul does, he takes that, that physical thing and he applies it to the spiritual, uh, calling out to Christ for salvation, Romans chapter 10. All right, let me give you another example of that, though. Look at Hosea chapter number 2. Uh, so spiritually, what we're going to see here at the end of chapter 9, this stuff applies to the Gentiles spiritually, uh, but doctrinally or prophetically, it applies to Israel. Uh, Hosea chapter 2. And look, if you would, at verse number... Uh, let's see here, uh, tw- 19, I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. Now, if you're not familiar with Hosea, uh, the nation of Israel is in apostasy, and God says, okay, I want you to go marry, he talks to Hosea, he goes, I want you to go marry a harlot. And when she leaves you and pursues that other lifestyle, I want you to go and I want you to plead after her and I want you to woo her back because that's going to be a picture of what I'm going to do with the nation of Israel at the end of the tribulation. All right. So look at uh, Hosea chapter two, verse number. Let's just skip down uh, in verse number uh, 21. It's going to pass in that day. I will hear, saith the Lord, I will hear the heavens and they shall hear the earth and the earth shall hear the corn and the wine, the oil, and they shall hear Jezreel. Talking about physical blessings uh, that come on the nation after they accept him. And I will sow unto her mercy, uh, uh, sow her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. And I will say to them which were not my people, thou art my people, and they shall say thou art my God. Now in the context of Hosea 2, he's talking about Israel. They get so bad off that they, he goes, you're not my people. Not like you were. They get so bad off that you guys, you know, in Revelation chapter 11, he says of Jerusalem, it is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. Revelation chapter 11. Sodom and Gomorrah, we just read it in Romans 9. They get so bad, the Israel, the, the nation of Israel gets so bad that while God's promises are still true to them, in the end, the in between. Can I say it like this? Let's let's just let's just go this way. How many of you guys appreciate eternal security? You appreciate that once you're saved, you're saved forever. Can we all admit that between the, t- the moment of salvation to the time you end up in heaven, there's a lot of stuff that happens that may cause people to question whether you're one of his kids? Aren't you glad that doesn't change the end? So Israel, as a nation, 
you know what, they're God's, Genesis chapter 12, we can go all the way back there, God says, I'll choose you, so on and so forth, and you know what happens over the course of history, man, they get so far off, you look at them toward the end of the tribulation, you go, there's no way they're God's chosen people, and you know what he says, you weren't my people, but I'm making my people again, I'm going to take you back, as a matter of fact, some people would say that God is not qualified to be in the ministry today, you know that? You know why? Because in Jeremiah, it says he gives the children of Israel a bill of divorcement. How's that for God not being qualified for the ministry? All right, I would say he is. Uh, I'm speaking tongue-in-cheek, obviously, but you know what he does? He restores that nation at the end, right? And you say, what happens? Well, blindness in part happens, and why? Their choice. Their choice. So what we're talking about here is man's choices and God's choices, individually, but also on a national level. Look at Hosea chapter number 1. Go back to Hosea chapter 1 and look, if you would, at uh, verse number uh, 6. And, and she conceived again, this is uh, uh, Hosea's wife, and bare a daughter, and God said to him, Call her Lohruhamah, for I will no more have mercy. Uh, can you imagine an, a, a Hebrew-speaking uh, Jew listening to us try to pronounce these names? <laughs> it's like when people look at my last name, they're like, uh, Mr. Rodriguez. I'm like, how'd you get Rodriguez from Dominguez, man? Um, <laughs> Uh, for I will, no, look, at, look at this, I will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. But I will have mercy upon the house of Judah, and will save them by the Lord their God, and will not save them by boat, and so on and so forth. But then the next chapter, you know what he says? If you read the whole thing, you know what he's talking about? When he reunites Israel and Judah together, and he brings them back, and he goes, I'll have mercy on you. I'll restore myself unto you. Now, you say, what is that based off of? Look at Zechariah, second to the last book of your Old Testament, Zechariah chapter 12. Then I'm going to give you some of these fill-in-the-blanks here, and we'll, we'll be done. Zechariah chapter 12, again, spiritually, all right, based on what Paul says in Romans 9.24, also of the Gentiles, and he goes into saying, these people that were not my people are my people. There's a spiritual application to the church, all right, because we were not his people, and God brings us in. All right, but doctrinally, prophetically, it's Israel. Look at Zechariah, uh, chapter number, what did I tell you, 12? Chapter 12, and look, if you would, at verse number 9. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem that has not happened yet, and I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. Check it out. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. That's the nation that killed them. We have no king but Caesar. Crucify him, crucify him. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Can I remind you guys that when uh, Joseph's brothers see Joseph, you know what they do? They cry and they sort of recoil back and they go, he's going to kill us. We were wrong. We, we tried to kill him and he was, the, he was the one that's trying to restore. He's the one that's here to be our deliverer. He's our savior in the end and we couldn't see it back here. Does that make sense? And so Israel goes, we couldn't see it back here, but oh my goodness, he was the Messiah. And what does Joseph do? He doesn't kill his brethren. He goes, brethren, God meant it for good. Let's get things right. And you know what Israel does at the end? You'll find this out. Go to Romans chapter number uh, 11. Romans chapter number 11. And we've already drawn a distinction between physical Israel and spiritual Israel. And it's pretty clear when, God, when Paul is talking about which one, it's pretty clear. Look at Romans 11 and look, if you would, at verse, uh, oh, let's see here. Uh, I'm looking for the verse that says, uh, all, oh, there it is, verse 26. And what does it say there? So all Israel shall be saved. You say, oh, that's spiritual Israel. Nah, uh, 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 uh. Go back to the verse prior. It would make absolutely no sense whatsoever. It's clearly a distinction between Gentiles and Israel. You're a Gentile in the flesh, so it's not you. If he says all Israel shall be saved, they're going to be delivered at the end of the tribulation. All right, Joel chapter 2, Zechariah chapter 12, verse number 10. So what is going on? Let's go to number 29, your outline. I'll give you some fill in the blanks. Remember, number 29, the context of chapter 9 is spiritual Israel versus physical Israel. There is a, there's a line there, along with what God chooses to do based on our choices. So the context of chapter 9 is spiritual Israel versus physical Israel, along with what God chooses to do based on our choices. Number 30, the spiritual application of these verses is a reference to the Gentiles as seen in John 10 in the discussion about sheep from another fold. You guys remember that? I have sheep that are not of this fold, and I'm going to bring them, they shall be one. Remember that? 
All right? John, uh, so let's read that again. The spiritual application of these verses is a reference to the Gentiles as seen in John 10 in the discussion about sheep from another fold. Number 31. The doctrinal application of these verses is a reference to the nation of Israel as found in the Old Testament prophetical writings of Hosea. The doctrinal application of these verses is a reference to the nation of Israel as found in the Old Testament prophetical writings of Hosea. All right? Uh, we'll stop there. We'll talk a little bit more about that remnant that he talks about. We're going to look at that as far as what is, uh, uh, refers to in prophecy uh, later on in Revelation. All right, let's all stand be dismissed in a word of prayer. Did you learn anything? All right, if you didn't learn anything else, don't play chess with God. Amen? He wins every time.